Okay, let's get started. Uh, first, I want to give you guys a walkthrough of uh, Crack Me One. Just a really quick one, since uh, I guess most of one, most of you saw this, right? Uh, some was in my office hour. Uh, we had trouble solving that, but uh, I think after the office hour, most of them solved that. Anyway, so. Here I'm using Battery Ninja to do this because it has this very nice uh, high level IR feature. It's kind of like a decompiler, but you cannot always trust what the decompiler gave you. For example, here we have the main function. Look at the prototype. This looks correct. Um, here we have uh, arc C equals to two, compare arc C with two, uh, then compare the strength of a global variable P with your input. So arc V1 is your command line input. So which means to pass this check, you have to provide one command line input and the length of that command line input has to be the same as the global variable P here. If you click global variable P, you can say that CSE security, okay? Do not count to the zero here. That doesn't count as a part of the string. Then you go into the function, you can say there is a local variable, which is a pointer. But if you check later, you can say this pointer is compared, is unsigned. This is u means unsigned. This is a, to compare with a larger integer. So this doesn't make sense. That's because the decompiler is not smart enough to identify this is not a pointer. This is actually just an integer. So so all those tools, they are called the uh, interactive these assemblers or decompilers because you can provide some information to this. For example, I know this is not a void or a star. This is actually uh, actually an int. I can even change the name. So I change it to let's say just a counter. Then I know this is a counter. It starts with zero. Then if we it's wire true, we compare the counter with the strength of that global variable nuns. At the beginning, it's just zero, right? So obviously we're going to, um, so obviously we will, we will go to here because it's not bigger than that. So here we have the counter plus that string. Then we dereference that. So we are getting each character of that global variable, that global string, then we plus one. For each of them, we plus one. And to compare with your input, okay? So that's why the secret here is actually the, the CSE security, every one, every character plus one. So it will be D, uh, T, um, F, that will be the secret. So if you give that secret, when you run this program, the program will keep running. Eventually it will, um, the counter will be greater than strength, so it will print the flag. But it, you cannot debug the program and hopefully get the flag because when you debug the program, the program will be uh, de demoted to a regular program. It will not be a set UID program. It will not be able to give you the, even if, it will get here, it will call the function print on the flag, but it cannot actually print on the flag. Okay, any questions here? Okay. Let's move forward. So uh, last week we started talking about uh, overwriting the return address. So uh, this class, we keep talking about that. Uh, we looked at how to call a function with uh, one argument, which is uh, the overflow return to function. Um, so, so what if the function we want to call has multiple parameters? So the principle here is the same. 
we already know where is the first argument. So the second argument will be just above that, right? So look at this challenge. This is uh, overflow return three. Everything stays the same, the same main function, the same uh, vol foo. Uh, the only difference is the print secret function takes two arguments, both of them are four bytes, and we're comparing the value of those. Um, so what, what is the size of your game? I don't remember. So obviously to solve this one, it will be similar to what we have before. Just uh, do a quick demo of that. Overflow return three. Now to solve all other challenges, the first you need to use a uh, piece assembler like object down to to figure out um, the actual size of that buffer and the binary level. You know, at say code level, you say it's um, six bytes. At a say code level, it's six bytes. It doesn't mean at binary level. The compiler will really generate six bytes for you. It could be more than six bytes. I'm showing you here. It's actually 14 bytes. So this is a call to uh, gets. And the parameter for that is in EAX. And EAX is actually EBP minus E, which is EBP minus 14, which means uh, you need a 14. The buffer is actually 14 bytes, not six bytes. Okay, so so to do this, what we need is uh, this one takes uh, from std in. So what do we do? Change. Firstly, the fourteen bytes of garbage to fill the buffer. So another four bytes to fill save the EVP. Um, then another four bytes. For the function address print secret, do we print it out? No, it didn't print it out. So uh, we can quickly debug this. So print print secret. Print secret. Very well. Oh. Like this. Okay. So this is the address for the so this is the address. What we need is we need to reverse this. So it will be one one. Six three five 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 six. Then we have another four bytes of garbage because we are trying to pass the parameter there. So after that, we can pass the two parameters. One is um, um, one two three four five six. Seven, eight. Uh, another one. Yeah, let me just do it this way. Another one is dead B, so it should be there. B. Okay, should be like this. Let's see if it works. Now we type this into week three. Okay, something's wrong here. Let's see what's wrong. What? Oh, yeah, should be AD, right? Okay, yeah, that, that's the error. So this is how we can pass two arguments and call a function. So as you can see that we can actually call any function, no matter how many arguments it has here, right? Then 
naturally we will ask the question, can we call arbitrary number of functions using this approach? Can we? So far we're just showing, we're just showing calling one function. What if we want to call many functions one by one? Can we actually be able to do that? So uh, I'm using 32 bit as an example, 64 bit for this one is much different actually because 64 bit, like I said, the parameters they are not on the stack, they are on registers. So, so things are much different. Um, so even calling a function with one parameter, 64 bit will be much different that we have to utilize um, another technique called uh, return to libc. Not, not return to libc. Uh, it's called a, oh, um, what's called that? Uh, return oriented programming. Okay, so that one we have to use TLISO, return oriented programming, which we will discuss at the second half of the semester. Okay. So uh, for the 32 bit, let's say if it's possible to call multiple functions. So assume this is what the stack look like for the vulnerable function. And this is before the uh, epilogue of the vulnerable function. So we have the EBP points to the saved EBP. Um, on top of that, we have the return address. So it would be function one, where function one calls the vol pool. Then we have the, guys, please be quiet. Who is speaking? Strong. Okay, whatever. Okay. So, so higher than the return address, we have the argument for the volfu, it can be many different arguments. And uh, the volfu has a vulnerable buffer here. So the attacker will, will be able to override everything from here. But we only have one chance to override this, okay? We do not have multiple chances to override, only one shot. That's what we got. So uh, after the epilogue of the volfu, um, what will happen is the ESP will go up eight bytes, we're pointing to here. Um, the return address, the, the return address actually will override to the, um, the first function we want to call, right? Um, then the EIP right now, we're pointing to the first function we want to call. Uh, the EDP will have this value here, whatever we override, for example, A here. Now, then, after the prologue of the F1, F1 is what we said out of here, is what we call, uh, we, 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 we return it to us, okay? So from F1's point of view, it's EBP points to this place. Previously, this is the address of F1. That's why we're, what we said here. So from its point of view, the return address is here. Uh, and here we can set it as F2. Okay, then we can have its argument F11, F12. Uh, so then when F1 finishes running, the ESP will move eight bytes higher than EBP again. Uh, if we set here as F2, what will happen is F2 can will consider its return address is here. So you can see, the return address every time it moves up four bytes, okay? For Volfu, it says the return address is at this place. For F1, it says return address is actually at this place, four bytes higher than um, previous F1. And for F3, for F2, its return address will be even um, four bytes higher. So this means if we are just want to return into functions that do not take any arguments. We can chain them together, no matter how long it is, right? So what we do is we simply, this is our one shot chance to overwrite the stack. What we're going to do is first, we overwrite the buffer, some paddings there, and then the save the EBP, done 
really, we don't really care what the value we put here. Then we just put the return address F1, F2, F3 here. Then those functions will be called one by one. Valfu will return to F1, F1 will return to F2, F2 will return to F3, okay? It's just, just that simple. So this one actually also works for 32 bit version because we're not setting any arguments anyway. Okay. So to show you an example of this, I designed uh, this challenge. Here, a very simple code the main function first print out the function addresses for you. There are five functions in this program, F1 to F5. Uh, each of them print out one word. F1 print out knowledge, F2 print out ease, um, F3 power, <coughs> uh, F4 print out friends, uh, F5 print out a uh, uh, bacon, okay? So we have this vulnerable function uh, at a SQL level, buffer is six bytes, like I said, it might be more than that. So our goal is to, so the function will print out all the function addresses. Main function will print out every function's address, then call the vulnerable function. The vulnerable function will take input from STD because there is a gets. So our goal is very simple. We want to print out uh, knowledge is power, France is bacon, okay? That's what we want to print out. So we are going to print out six words and we are going to call those five functions in total six times. So, so after that, after we call the bacon one, it will exit. So you should, should not print out IP to the full, okay? So let's say, how can we do that? Use the approach I just showed you. Should be, oh, where is it? Mm, okay, looks like the TA forgot to put it here. Okay, so I will use my local machine to show this. I will ask the TA to add it to the server later. So you can see this is exactly the same function, same code. Um, I think I already compiled this. So the ORC is uh, the o ORC is a 32 bit version of the code of the program. So what we want to do is we want to print out. Um, so we want to call F1, return to F1, so return to F2, the F3, the F4, the F2 again, the F5, right? That's what we want to do. So the first step is here, check what, how, how big is the buffer there. Uh, you can see this is E, okay, steer 14. So the same with Python. Uh, in my computer, Python is Python 2, I remember. So I don't need to Python 2. Yeah. On my computer, my Python is Python 2. Um, so print. So we need um, 14, 14 bytes of garbage. Then the first address. So the first one should be 2B, B, 
So even even if we do this, it should generate um it should generate uh, one output, right? Uh, why it's not? Are we are we giving up correct address there? Oh, the order is wrong, right? Sorry, should be two D B two. 2 d b two six two five six okay so like this um, why we're we coding twice what's going on here let me see if the Python is correct okay Python looks right um, so we will we pipe into this. Function address. Okay, it's possible that it crashes before it send out the um, send out the what do they want to print in the buffer. So let's finish this. The second one. Oh, we can we can try the last one first. This one should be correct. A one three two six two five six. Hmm, still not correct. Okay, what's what's wrong here? What do I what did I miss here? What did I miss? Something here is wrong. Which one is wrong? E is 14, right? We need four more, four more bytes of garbage. So this should be 18. This one should be 18. Okay, so when we do 18, let's say if we put the address right, 2D, or should be F2. Oh. You see, on my computer, every time the address is changing, you see that? Yeah, I forgot to disable ASLR. Let me disable ASLR on my computer. Uh, on the cloud, I already disabled ASLR. ASLR is something we're going to learn uh, later. Okay, let's run it again. So after we disable SR, every time we run this program, the address should not change. And see, now we have the same address when we run it twice. So the purpose of that SR is to <coughs> is for security. So every time it changes the address, so it's harder for the attacker to uh, attack this. So it should be six to Five five. And here we have a one six two five 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 six. Okay, and now it works. So now we can print out uh, knowledge bacon. So if we add everything together, we add the other four addresses. So the second one we want to call is um, four a. Six two five 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 six. After that, we want to call function three. Which is six seven six two five 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 six. Um one two three. Then we are going to call uh, function four, which is eight four six two five 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 six. Then we call function two again, <coughs> which gives us e, which is four a six two. 
divide by five six. Okay, so this should print out. Um, okay, let me put something wrong here. Okay. Seven six two five six eight four. I do not see any error. Did I see any error? Anyone say something wrong here? Oh, A, it's two. Everything looks good to me. What's going on? <clears throat> well, this one is correct, so it should be correct. Oops, I probably missed the something. This one is correct. Okay. This one is also correct. Correct. A four. Hmm. What's the problem? Oh, there, there was a Y space. Yeah, that's a problem. There was a Y space. Okay. So you can say we return into those five functions one by one. One of the functions we actually return into twice. Uh, the reason it didn't work before is because there was a Y space. So Y space is uh, X20, I believe. Yeah, so that's screw up everything. Okay, so you can see that using this approach, we can call arbitrary number of functions one by one, um, as long as they do not take any arguments. Uh, this also works for 64 bit. Uh, however, can we extend this to call arbitrary functions with arguments? Can we do that? So remember, we only have one shot over right here. So the key here is for Valfu. So let's say if we, this is what we overwrite, right? Uh, we have the return address of, of one here. Uh, F2 here, then we have argument. So F1 has to take one argument. So this is where we put F1's argument. F2, we also need to put one argument. Uh, that's why we put an argument here. So after calling, so after calling F1, F2, we already use all the space here. That's why if we want to call F3, the return address of F3 has to be here, okay? So, but this is a space, we need to write the argument for F1, okay? So that there is a conflict. That's why using this approach, we cannot call, we cannot return into um, arbitrary number of functions with one argument. We can only do this at least for two functions. Of course, there is a rare chance, rare case that the argument of F1 is exactly the same as the, the address of F3. Then in those cases, we can technically we can call into three functions or even four, right? But um, that do not usually happen. Okay, so now you have seen how to overwrite the return address to uh, do the control flow uh, hijacking. Um, but so far, what you have seen is you are hijacking the control flow to some. Uh, existing functions uh, in the program's address space. Uh, next, uh, we are going to learn something more uh, interesting, but we cannot finish this part of today or say how much we can finish. Then uh, Wednesday, we will keep talking about this. So basically, we want to overwrite the return address. Uh, however, we're not going to jump return into any existing function. We're going to return to our own share code. 
and our own share code can do anything we want it to do. Uh, usually, what we do is we ask the share code to create a share for us, so we can type any command. So um, this is a vulnerable uh, function, uh, overflow return for. Uh, the C function gets here, retrieve from STD in and store whatever you put there uh, to this buffer. And the buffer here, I make it a little bit bigger so it can fit our share code. So the vulnerability here is the same, even though the buffer is a little bit larger, the vulnerability here is the same. It's because the buffer has a limited size. Um, even though the battery level, it could be a little bit bigger than 30 bytes, but still limited size. But you can input a very long string to overwrite everything. That's the same vulnerability. Um, so at a high level, the idea is uh, we want to return to a piece of code that we put into the program's address space. So how do we um, overwrite, or how do we put the code um, in the address space? We can put it just in a buffer, right? We can uh, put it in a buffer, then we point, point that um, return address to our buffer. For example, uh, this is a ball whose stack, what it looks like. Uh, if there's no attack, it has a buffer, it has a saved uh, EVP, it has a return address. Uh, the return address should be part of the main function. And uh, the buffer looks like this. Now, if we overwrite, uh, we can override this part as whatever we want. We can also override this part as whatever uh, we want. So what we can do is we put the malicious code, our share code, just here. That's one way to do it. Then we change this pointer. This is a code pointer. We change this code point coordinate to point here, right? That's how we can do it. Um, of course, it's possible that this buffer is not big enough. It's not big enough to put our share code there, okay? In that case, um, we can put the share code on top of this because this is also what we can write. Right. Uh, another thing is, what if we don't know the exact address of this space, of uh, this place? In that case, we can put some NOP operations in front of our share code. The NOP operation in x86 is just one byte, is uh, 88 in hex. That means doesn't the CPU doesn't do anything, but just go to the next instruction, okay? So we can have a huge knob in front of the share code. Then what will happen? As long as we hit to the, so the whole knob, we call it a sled, sled. So as long as we hit the sled, eventually our share code will execute, right? So that's our goal. So, but if in some cases we know exact address, then we don't have to put a knob. But in most cases, you do not know the exact location when you're, when you're doing uh, any kind of attack, okay? Okay, so look at the um, example code again. Uh, we have, uh, uh, in this case, um, first time, first we find out where the buffer is. If we disassemble the code, we can say the buffer is actually at EBP minus 30 in hex. So at second level, the buffer is 30 bytes. However, in battery level, it's not 30 bytes. It's 30 in hex, which is uh, 48 bytes, actually. Um, then 48 bytes, in this case, is big enough for us to put something called a share code here, okay? So share code is a piece of battery code. Uh, here I'm giving you an example. Only 28 bytes of, um, of um, code and we can use this code to get us a shell. So let's, this is a, the, the byte string you can use in this class. 
um, but before you use it, I want to show you what exactly this means uh, line by line. Okay, so let's look at this 10, several, just the 12 instructions, try to understand why this piece of code can give us a share. Okay. <clears throat> So the first thing you can see is, um, let's say, uh, remember the share code is about to make some system calls. And if we want to get a share, means we are going to make the system call exe cve, which create, create a new process, which replace the current process with a new process. And we want to use, uh, replace the current process with a share process and the share is in, uh, slash bin slash sh. That's one of the shells. There are many other shells you can use, but we choose to use a very simple one. This is a very simple shell, uh, as you can see on my local computer. On my local computer, I have a fancy shell. This is called a V shell, but I, I, we can also go back to the very simple shell like this. Okay. So now we have a very simple shell. This is a very simple shell. Um, it has a dollar sign here. It doesn't have, it doesn't tell me which folder I am in, um, but it is a functioning shell. So if I exit, I go back to my Z shell. Z shell is much more powerful. Okay. So we only want to get a, a, a basic shell here. Then to do that, we just need to make uh, the system call. And this piece of code is and the first is just making that system call. After that, it make a lot of system call. We will see why we need to do that. Okay, uh, to remind you how to make a EXE system call, uh, we actually went through this a little bit uh, in the first week. Uh, first, you need to set the EAX as 11. That's because this is a system call and this is the EAX would be set as 11. Uh, then uh, the first argument for this one is a file name. The file name is actually the new program you want to execute, the name of that. So in our case, is the string uh, being a sh. It is a string, okay? Uh, so we need to put the string somewhere and put the value into EBX. Uh, here it's uh, this is not necessarily correct, actually, it should be uh, several ways. Then, then we need to have the, the address of uh, um, the, the argv for this program. So here you are creating a program, and this program can take argv because this program has a main function. And this is how you want to um, what provide, so which is address of this string again and uh, just a zero there. The environment variable, we don't need that, we just, uh, so we put zero. So uh, I think for most uh, systems, even the second parameter, you can set a zero, it will still work, okay? So then let's look at this piece of share code, try to uh, understand how it works. Um, uh, we, I put the important register here, and this is a stack. The stack goes from High level address to low level address. And uh, uh, from left to right, we go from low to high. The first instruction we have is uh, uh, X4, exclusive or EAX with EAX, which means clear the value of EAX. So after this, EAX will be zero. Also, remember, you can see uh, this is the address. The address doesn't matter here. Uh, this is a uh, a piece of somebody code or a somebody code, and this is a binary code. Okay, this is a binary code, and you can see that there is no zeros in all those bytes. In those 20, 28 bytes, there is no zero. Okay, the reason is we intentionally remove the zeros because if the vulnerable function is a string copy, the, the string copy will stop at zero, right? So if there is a zero, we will not be able to fully copy the share code. That's why there's no zero. <coughs> okay, so after that, we will push. So year x value is zero. 
Then we push EAX. So what will happen? EAX is four bytes. So we're pushing four zeros onto the stack. So this, you can see those two instructions, we can equivalently, we can just do push zero. That would be one instruction. Why do we do X or EAX, then push EAX? The reason is to avoid the having zero in those bytes, okay? If we just do push zero, it will be same thing on the stack or ever there will be a zero. So after that, we push those <coughs> two weird things here, okay? We're sure we'll figure out what this is. We're pushing those two values onto the stack. Then uh, from the stack point of view, this is no, this is high, this is no, this is high, okay? So actually this is a string. If we check the ASCII table, we can see that uh, the, the string is 2f62, blah, 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 okay? Um, yeah, there, there are two f there, okay? So the string is actually uh, forward slash bin, forward slash, forward slash sh. It's a little bit different from what we have before, right? What do we have here is there's only one slash. So why do we, two, why, why are we using two slash here? What? No, that's not true. That's a good guess, but it's not true. For Linux, for any Linux systems, they don't really care how many stashes you have, okay? So when you do bin stash sh, it's the same as you add many more stashes. For Linux kernel, that's the same thing. It's just one stash, see? That's one stash. Of course, you can add the stashes here as well. Okay, that will be that will be the same thing, just one stash. Okay, so so the reason we put two stashes here is not this is an escape or something. It's only it's only because we want to uh, fill the whole thing with uh, four bytes. So this stash can be used as padding. Imagine we do not fill this with a stash. At the end, we will have a zero, right? Because that will be the end of the string. We want a zero. We don't, then that zero will show up um, in the code, and we don't want that. That's why we fill this with a, a lot of stash here, okay? So after that, uh, we move ESP to EBP because we just have a push. So the ESP points to the string now. The, what do we have the string? We have the string, we have four bytes of zero. Technically, we don't need four bytes of zero, right? You can see that what we're doing here is we are setting up the string. And technically, we only need one byte of zero. But because of this instruction, we're actually having four bytes. Doesn't really matter. So we move ESP, which is the address of this, to the register EBP, because it has a string. <laughs> Uh, looks like a type of this should be go here. Um, <coughs> oh, yes, yeah, should be not be zero. EBP, EBP now points to here. Then we move EAX to ECX. EAX we know is zero. So after this instruction, ECX is zero. Then after this, we move ECX to EAX to EDX. So EDX is also zero. Okay. So after this, we move uh, B. B is 11, we move 11 to AL. So now we finished setting up all the registers. We actually only set up two registers, once EAX, which is 11, uh, then EBX, which point to the string. And ECX, EBX, like I said before, uh, for most of the systems, uh, those two arguments can just be zero, it will work, okay? So now after this, we are ready to make the system call. And to make the system call, we just use the int 80 instruction. Okay, after this, after this instruction, if everything goes smoothly, what should happen is a new process will be created. The new process is the share process. Okay, so technically, our share code can stop here. 
it should stop. Why do we have three more instructions? If everything goes smoothly after this instruction, a new process is running, right? So those three instructions will not even be there anyway. But why do we have those three instructions? No, they, they, there is some um, some purpose for it. Yes, that is an exit, but why do we need an exit? In case of what? Oh, okay, you, you, you actually get it right, okay. But what, what doesn't work? The previous one doesn't work. The creation doesn't work, right? So if this, creation new process doesn't work. What will happen is the, the CPU will keep executing your code because it's not creating new process, right? If you do not put it here, it means it will just execute some garbage in your memory. And most likely it will crash the program, right? So as an attacker, if the, the program is crashed, uh, the, the user may notice that. That's why you want to exit in a graceful way, you're not showing the segment fault. So how do you exit in a graceful, a graceful way? Is you have this uh, calling exit zero. So what you do is you set EAX of zero again. Then, uh, so EAX is zero, then you increase EAX, so EAX is one. Uh, then you just do uh, call this uh, interrupt. So I call this uh, yeah, system call. If you go to back to that table again, you can say exit. When when you do exit, you put EAX value as one. Okay, then the EBX is the return value, but in this case, you don't care the return value. So EBX you didn't touch. Yeah. So that is how this piece of a uh, share code uh, works. So um, next, uh, we are going to try this on my. Uh, let's try on my local computer because on cloud things will be a little bit more complicated. So that's what I want to show you uh, next class. Uh, let's see. Which one is it? Overflow return. Well, we can pull. Okay. okay, you can see this. Oh, I changed the oh, the code is a little bit different here. There is uh, 40 bytes. So why should you just now it's 30 bytes? So let's check. <coughs> um, okay, so make sure this one works. Protection, I just do that. That's correct. Cool. Um, so OBJ. So this is a vulnerable function. You can say here. Um, the buffer actually is EBP minus 30, <coughs> which is 48 bytes. Then we can, um, we can actually, in this one, we can actually find out where the buffer is, right? Let's try to find the, the exact location of the buffer. We do a, a GB. Around this. So now we are in Valfu. Just keep going until we get the size. Okay. So we just executed this instruction, which is EB uh, load effective address, EBP minus 30 to EAX. So right now we know that the buffer's actual address is in EAX. Oh, by the way, you can see here this is the entire syntax. 
the syntax a little bit different. Uh, before the ins before the registers, there is no percentage sign. This is entire syntax. Uh, so EAX is actually where the buffer is, and uh, this is an EAX value. So say AD8, uh, say AD8. Let's copy that. That's our that's our buffers address. That's our buffers address. Uh, that's the only thing we need here. Okay, so now um, let me see. We have a uh, come on, let me copy this. Let me copy this thing. This is our, this is our share code. So what we want to do is this is our share code. Um, there's something wrong. Oh, there's two lines in this. Okay, this is correct. We want to put this piece of share code at the beginning of our buffer, right? Uh, so, so, go back to this slide. Now we know that this buffer is 48 bytes or 30 in hex. At the beginning of this, we put 28 bytes of share code, which means we need another 20 bytes of garbage to fill the whole buffer, right? So after that, we need a four bytes to override the save the EBP, right? That's 24 bytes of garbage. Then we can put the return address and the return address we want to put to the beginning of the buffer. Make sense? Okay, let's try that. So now we have 28 bytes, which will go to the beginning of the buffer. Then we need another 24 bytes based on our calculation, right? Another 24 bytes. So after that, we should have four bytes of uh, address, which points to exactly here. And that address is, uh, say, a D D eight C A D D eight C A F F F F. Okay, so that should be our. So this whole thing is what we call an exploit. So this, when we send this exploit to the vulnerable program, <coughs> it should give us the shell. Okay, let's see if it works. I'm not sure if the calculation is correct, but let's try. Nope, don't work. Something's missing here. Um, let's say, let's try to redo this. So this is 28 bytes. So this is EBP minus 30, that's 48 bytes. The whole thing is 28 bytes. So we have 20 bytes. Mm, looks like it's correct. Oh, 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 yeah, that's because I'm not using, um, sorry, I should use the r.sh to get the, because when I debug that using GDB, the address I get on the stack is different um, from when I do not use GDB. In GDB, we push more data on the stack, okay? So that's why I have another tool called r.sh here. Uh, when we when we use r.sh, that program makes sure that the stack is always balanced without, no matter you are using GDB or not. So we will use those tools first, then we will say, how can we, um, how can we hack this without using this tool, okay? So let's do a GDB, this one again, and let's uh, break Volvo, then we just run this. So we are here, we're going to uh, F, we're going to FD. FD, okay, now we print uh, EAX. Oops. 
to okay so it's say a e8 that's the address we want to use say a e8 say it's a uh, um like uh, how many bytes off several bytes off so this one then we're going to do uh, r r dot sh um so r dot sh or four uh it's taken from where it's taking from okay let's put this into uh, exploit exploit then let's do r dot sh Type this back to exploit. Hmm, looks like we need to debug what's going on. Okay, so we can debug this by doing uh, <coughs> let's do uh, r dot sh gdb or four, we're going to set a breakpoint at lawful. We uh, run this program. We're going to redirect the exploit to ourselves. Okay, so now we are. Oh, by the way, uh, in this class, you will see all kinds of weird things, and the only way to figure it out is debug. Okay, that's why you use GDB a lot. So, right here, let's say we go to next one. Uh, let's try to get to uh, FD first to say now we are at FD. We print um, EAX. The EAX should print to the buffer size, the, the, the buffer's address, which is this. Then we are at here. So next, if we call this one, it should get our input from that file we put there. Let's say if that's correct. Now we are in FE. Oh no, one more step. Okay. Now we are in, we are out of here, which means we just finished calling gets. So the buffer, which is this, should have our share code now. Let's take a look if our share code is there. So we exam, X is exam. Then we exam, let's say 28 bytes. Um, maybe. Then we exam that address, which is FFFFCA8. Okay, that's, is that our share code? Looks like our share code, right? 31 C0 CDAB. Let's see if that's our share code. 31 C0 CDAB. Okay, looks like our share code. So this one looks like our share code. Um, let's say, how about 48 bytes? 48 bytes, okay, that's correct. That's our garbage there. Then after 48 bytes, there should be another four bytes of uh, saved EDP. So 52 bytes, there should be four more A's, okay? Then we should have, um, then the next four bytes should be the address. Let's see if that's correct. Oh, that is also correct. F F F F C A E eight. Looks like it's correct. Okay, then let's keep debugging to say. Uh, looks like this one is working. Okay, so where are we? We are here. <coughs> so next, what we want to debug is we want to debug to return, right? To say if return is actually return to returning to our share code. So we keep going on tier OC. Okay, now we are at OC. Uh, instead of NI, right now I'm going to step in to say where we're going. It's supposed to go to our share code. Okay, looks like we are in our share code. Uh, so disassemble here doesn't work anymore because 
this command disassemble only works for functions, and this is not a function. But we can still disassemble this. Use another uh, command called uh, uh, x. X is exam. So previously we are examining, for example, we are examining 28 bytes from where our uh, EIP is, and this is our share code. This is byte by byte. We can also examine this as instructions. Just change this i, uh, change from b byte to instruction. And we don't have so many 28 instructions, maybe 30 instructions. Now we get the instruction. Okay, now you can see that that is our share code. Uh, everything looks correct. Okay, so then we just uh, step by step, we call in this. So FD should be when we create a new process, FD. Okay. Okay, now we're going to execute this one okay actually actually it is uh, it, it was successful it created a new program uh the bin you see okay just uh when we, are, when we are doing so you see here a new process is created and that is the uh, bin slash sh of course bin slash sh in my computer actually points to dash uh then the debugger will say uh the pre the the breakpoint doesn't make sense anymore because we have a new program. The previous breakpoint had lawful, that makes sense anymore. The new program doesn't have a function lawful. Um, then it exits here. Okay, so so which means our program is actually uh, correct here. So I think what possible run is, let's say, um, I'm going to do a cat here. I think that's the problem. Let's try. Oh, yeah, it works, I guess. Yeah, it works. Okay, so what, what's the problem was is uh, after we send you that uh, deploy to the vulnerable program, um, the new process is created. However, the new process also exists. So you see, when we run this, it's not printing off that dollar sign. Okay, it's not giving us a dollar sign, but it's actually we already create a shell. I can prove you by we can type anything here. I can type. Where am I here? Uh, I can type, uh, where is that says? Okay, so this is a shell. So if we want to try this on the, let's try the same thing um, on the server, things would be a little bit different because we cannot get the exact address because the r.sh may not work there. Um, okay, uh, here is the thing. That's why I mentioned that. Uh, let's, let's, let me exit here. So in the example I just showed you, we find out exactly where we find out exactly where the buffer is, right? Then we jump to it. And to find out that we use the, first we use the GDB and we use the, that tool r.sh. Um, however, on the server, may, we may not be able to use r.sh, especially if you are attacking someone, you cannot run the tool r.sh to balance the stacks, right? So you probably can run the program, but you cannot find the exact address. So how do we, so how do we uh, jump to our code without knowing the exact address? Uh, we don't know how much. Oh, we can guess. Uh, that's why the most yeah, the most we can in that case, we cannot put, we obviously cannot put the share code here, right? 
we put the share code above, then we have a lot of space there. Uh, our share code is only 28 bytes, but we can put uh, we call it micro small. So let's let's try that. Okay. So now we are creating a new uh, exploit. This time uh, we the same the same thing here. We need to fill the buffer, but in the buffer we're not going to put the share code. We just put we just put some garbage in the buffer. Let's say we need uh, uh, how many? Forty-eight. 48 plus four, right? 52, 52 bytes of garbage. Then return address, which we don't know uh, what return address should be. Uh, then we put a knob sled, right? Like I said, knob sled is simply lighted. Then we can make a huge knob sled. That's 2,000 bytes a lot. So if we hit any of those bytes in the middle, then we get that. Then at the end, uh, we can delete the, those those things. Well, they don't really matter anymore, right? But let's delete that. Okay. Then without using our dot sh, we do not use that. Uh, now we just guess where that is. Uh, ff. We know we know it's on stack, so it's somewhere. Uh, the previous address we are using is this. Say a e eight. Uh, let's try to use that. Okay. Say a e eight. Um, I don't know if it works. Let's try. Oops, it works. Nope, nope, it's not working. Hmm. So we keep guess, guessing here. We can make this higher, right? Because, because we put the whole thing here, that's that, that a higher address, and we have a huge slab. So technically, we can add, make this number higher. So let's change this to D. Let's see if it works. Still not working. Uh, D is not enough. Change to E. So every time we change here, we're after changing 200 bytes, right? Oh no! Why change here is more than 200 bytes. Why change here is huge. Why change here is 200 bytes. Yeah. Okay. Maybe it's two. Make make it even bigger. Nope. Mm. So which number should we guess? Makes more sense. So previously it was a CA E8. Now should it be so CA E8 is the one with GDB. So without GDB, it will be higher. Now we put the share code, so you should be even higher. Okay. Hmm. So maybe this one we change it too big to F. Oh, it works. Now we hit. I change this to uh, say F. Then now we get a share. Okay. So, so let's try something else. So previously was say E. I changed it to say F. Then because our our knob sled is huge here, so I think uh, something D two should also work. We have a have a huge slab there, right? It still work. Okay. Everything makes sense. Well, it's because when we return, the address is there. The address is in the middle. We don't know where our Okay, so that's one 
I have for today. Uh, I'm demoing and demo on my local computer and share my computer. Work on this one on the server. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Next amount is show on the server. So, uh, I don't think the RF is showing it. Oh, actually, I have it on my slides. What's going on? So this is a website. It has all kinds of share codes. Uh, you can say you can find uh, you can find a different. Uh, what's going on? You can find a different share code for different architectures and different share code for different purpose. Um, somehow I cannot get the share code. Where is the share code? <clears throat> no, it's not for sure. Code. Okay. Uh, anyway, this is just the one of the share codes, and this this share code <coughs> is to get the share. Yeah. The other share code, for example, read a file, send a file. All right. We are going to write some of the share code like that. Um, is this so? Is there like a simpler if you make it shorter? Is it yes, for example, this one, like I said, uh, the last the five bytes because we don't need it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, then there are other ways to make it shorter, but this one is pretty short. I, I think I've seen something x 36 probably 21 bytes, 21, 21 bytes, the shortest. Um, yeah, this one is only after you delete that, it's only 25 bytes, right? Sorry about that. I have one more question. So, it's kind of like, like, can you like draw out the actual output? Well, actually, I think you can do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, like, let's say, can you make an option? Let's say, mm -hmm. right now, there's a set that's in the small stack. Right? Hold on. Let me, let me, let me turn off the recording first. Uh, 